welcome to this event, Turning Ethical AI into a Technical Reality, and we're going to look into the role of open source and standardization within that. My name is Jack Parrick. I'm a journalist here in Brussels, best known, I think, probably for my work on, on Euronews, uh, the TV channel. Thank you so much to Open Forum Europe for hosting this event, and also to Timo Vulcan, uh, an S&D MEP who is also the co-host of this. So the way the event's going to work is we're going to um, have a short introduction from each of our speakers, um, and then we are going to move into a 20-odd minute uh, panel discussion about more on a sort of technical implementation side of, of AI and artificial intelligence. And then we're going to move on to a policy-based uh, discussion, probably somewhere, you know, there'll be crossovers, but generally we'll start looking more into the policy. And then we'll have 20 minutes or so with questions and answers where you can direct your questions to each of our speakers um, in order to uh, uh, have a sort of free-flowing debate. But as things are being discussed throughout this panel event, please feel free to use the chat on the side of Hopin, I hope you can all see it, to start writing questions. And if the questions are sort of really targeted to the discussion that we're having at that particular moment, um, then we will, uh, then we will uh, begin to sort of bring those questions in. So as I mentioned, I'll, int I'll introduce the, uh, our speakers. So we have Timo Volken, who is uh, an MEP from the S&D Group. We have Johan Friedrich, who is from IBM. Uh, we have Deborah Di Giacomo, who is uh, from Waveform, who, which is a consultancy. We have Romeo Kainzler, um, who is also from IBM. And we have Imr Ibrahim Hadid, who is from the, uh, from the Linux Foundation, specifically looking into AI and data. So without further ado, I'll, I'll pass the floor to Timo Vulcan to give a short introductory speech. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope my connection is stable today. Uh, okay. Welcome. Yeah, okay. <laughs> That's a relief. Welcome to our event on open source for ethical um, artificial intelligence. My name is, as, uh, as I already said, Timo Wirken. I'm a member of the European Parliament, and it's my pleasure to co host this event together with. Uh, the Open Forum Europe. We are all looking forward to our discussion, so I'll try to be as brief as possible. Um, I am a member of the Legal Affairs Committee, and as such, I'm heavily involved in digital policy files. Notably, my committee has produced three reports on artificial intelligence um, that were adopted by the plenary last month. Um, so we adopted one on intellectual property rights for the develop for the development of artificial intelligence, one on civil liability uh, aspects of artificial intelligence, and one on a framework of ethical aspects of artificial intelligence. So the latter is particular very relevant to our discussion today. I, uh, it complements the Commission's white paper on artificial intelligence from earlier this year, which, as you know, lays down a broad, broad framework for an ecosystem um, of excellence and an ecosystem of trust. And in order to have these ecosystems of trust, artificial intelligence needs to be based on ethical criteria that reflect our European values. And two things immediately spring to mind in this context, which are also uh, central to the ethics report by the European Parliament. AI needs to be human centric and AI needs to be as transparent as possible. So open source provides from my point of view exactly this. When the code and data are available to the general public, we achieve a high level of transparency, which not just ensures human oversight, but collective human oversight, which is, I think, even better. And uh, I think it's an important bias. And finally, this is just um, the starting point for the discussion as to why open source can be beneficial to shape artificial intelligence um, according to our values and expectations. And I'm very glad to be discussing with you how we can achieve this from a technical point of view, but also from a 
policy point of view uh, in the second half of our discussion. Thank you very much indeed, Timo. Thank you for your introductory remarks. Now we're going to move on to Johan Friedrich, who is the Technical Relations Executive at IBM. And Johan's going to speak to us a little bit about the sort of lingo that we're going to use and be a bit sort of outline some of the definitions of what we're talking about. So I'll hand the floor over to you. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, and thank you for organizing this. Thanks, Timo, for bringing us all together here. It's absolutely exciting. My name is Jochen. I work for IBM, where I'm heading the Department for Standardization and Technical Regulation in Europe. Um, and I, I've given the pleasure to give a brief introduction here about uh, what, uh, what we see. Oops, and it starts with the last slide. Sorry, let me go to the beginning. Not sure why it started in the end. OK. Um, about artificial intelligence, and I put it under the headings of responsible computing, different topics in AI, and open technologies. And I've got seven to 10 minutes, so I need to be brief and focus on the main things. Um, I always love to start with this pretty old slide here, um, which outlines the, the spectrum around cognitive technologies, as we love to call it in IBM, having artificial intelligence here on the, on the top, and it is supposed to be on the top, um, but then there are a number of other um, technology topics, I'm, 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 I'm lacking a better word, like uh, robotics, machine learning systems, natural language processing, deep learning, predictive analytics, recommendation engines, um, all these things play into the cognitive technology portfolio and um, uh, probably need to be uh, considered when we talk about AI in a broader sense. And usually there is, um, all of this is meant when people talk about AI and very often there's also a bit of confusion. Uh, looking at the next slide, it tries to, to limit this to four topics. Neural networks, deep learning, machine learning, and artificial intelligence. And a, a colleague of mine, and you see the floor at the bottom has, has put this into the fantastic allegory of the Russian nesting dolls. Um, where you see that one is included in the other. So at the very bottom, you have neural networks, which mimic the human brain through a set of algorithms. Essentially, you differentiate four components, inputs, weights, thresholds, or bias. And then the next level, you have deep learning, which is referring to the depth of the layers in a neural network. And, and usually, if you say you have more than three layers, that can be considered um, a, a deep learning algorithm. Right, a neural network with more than three layers. Next level, machine learning. Um, deep learning again is a subset of machine learning. The way in which they differ is that the algorithm learns. Machine learning model can cluster, can classify inputs just to sketch out the good predictions. And then on the very top, the the the, the all uh, encompassing Russian nesting doll, you have AI, which mimics human intelligence. It's used to automate, to optimize tasks, humans, uh, like speech, facial recognition, decision making, translation, these, these kind of things. Um, what we like to, to bring up and what we believe in IBM is important is to differentiate between good AI, bad AI, and mainly addressing the use of AI. And we have a lot of, um, right, lot I'm of areas. I'm going to stop here. AI. Ibrahim. Um, so, so, Ibrahim, I think your microphone is open and it's giving us a bit of feedback. Okay. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Much better. So, um, there are some, some basic principles on AI, trust and transparency principles. So, um, first of all, the purpose of AI is to augment human intelligence. It's not to replace it. It is in, to enhance and to extend human capability and potential. Secondly, data and insights belong to their creator. So the client's data is their data and their insights are their insights. That's, that's also an important um, uh, transparency and trust principle. And thirdly, new technology, including AI systems, must be transparent and explainable. Um, it must be clear about who trains AI systems, what data was used, data governance policies uh, need to ensure that people understand how an AI system uh, came to a conclusion or a recommendation um, and the issue of data bias needs to be addressed proactively. Going a step further, imperatives for artificial intelligence for 
for companies based on whether they are provider or owner or both of an AI system. And here I'd like to come up with these five. Um, first of all, say designate a lead AI ethics official. Um, AI is a topic that is new for us, how to use the technology. We all want to have responsible uh, AI, trustworthy AI, um, need to be accountable for internal guidance and, and compliance mechanisms. So here an AI ethics official um, uh, should oversee these tasks and, and uh, be the focal point um, for this in a, in a company, in an organization. Um, use different rules for different risks. It is very important to differentiate. There are a high level assessment should be done on the potential harm uh, that can be done on the risk level. And according to this, different rules should be applied, assessed, in-depth detailed assessments must be done. Don't hide your AI. That's also very important, we believe. Um, promoting the transparency is through disclosure. Make, uh, make purpose of an AI system clear to customers, uh, to consumers, businesses with whom you work, but also inside of your organization. If you use it, explain your AI. Have audit trails surrounding uh, the input and training data. Make documentation available. And finally, test AI for bias. Um, responsible AI systems are fair and secure and we always need to check is the is the is there any bias and this is an ongoing process it's not something that is done once it needs to be done um, as ai systems are operating um, on a similar way we have seen the uh, high level expert group on ai um, uh, working with the european commission um, on ethics guidelines, artificial intelligence. Um, they have produced these guidelines and they list seven key requirements that you see in the two boxes at the bottom here. Human agency and oversight, technical robustness and safety, privacy and data governance, transparency, diversity, non-discrimination and fairness, societal and environmental well-being, and accountability. Now, coming from, from these introductory perspectives, imperatives, principles, guidelines. Um, we believe that standards, open standards and open source play an important role here to create trust, to create transparency around AI systems. Both standards and open source are part of open technologies, um, uh, but they are not the same. That's why I have this slide included. It's not specific on AI, but standards provide something like a building plan, methods, metrics, processes, protocols, they are developed collaboratively in standards developing organizations. Um, and uh, you can see not controlled by a single vendor. They may include patented technologies, open standards, typically um, if, they, if they are implementable in open source, uh, should not, they should be free of, of patent claims um, and, and licensing claims for, for patents. Open source is source code, it's software. It's developed as well collaboratively, usually in projects, communities, open source foundations, and we will hear about the Linux Foundation AI later on. They have certain governance models. They are openly available. Open source um, uh, software is openly available to distribute, to fork, to do with it, whatever you like, and typically licensed under an OSI approved open source license. Illustrating a bit the organizational ecosystem around standardization and open source, you have on the top here, the standardization environment um, with the on the left hand side, the uh, recognized international standards bodies recognized under WTO um, agreement, um, ISO, IEC, ITU on the middle layer, the European standardization organizations to provide standards in support of regulation and policies in Europe of the, of the harmonized co uh, common market and on the bottom on the left national bodies and towards the right you have the so-called um, four rand consortia other global standards bodies almost everywhere here ai standardization activities are going on a major focus and i will briefly go into this in in a second is in jtc1 the joint technical committee one between iec and isa um, this is where international it standardization takes place and a subcommittee is in place there, the subcommittee 42, working on a number of highly relevant um, AI standards, also highly relevant in terms of ethics, trust, transparency. And on the bottom, just giving you some 
open source groups, open source foundations. You all know the Linux Foundation and Linux Foundation AI, where we will hear later on from Ibrahim about their work. The Eclipse Foundation, the IoT Eclipse group, or Node Kubernetes, many, many others. Just to sketch the differences in organizations and the landscape. Now, looking at AI activities, there are major activities going on. As I said, ISO, IEC, JTC1, SC42 is the major international committee where AI work is going on. And also IEEE has done a lot of pioneering work in AI standardization. ITU, I put a bit in brackets, there is some work going on, um, driven by some, it's currently evolving. We need to look into this and how it matches with the others. On the regional level, we have had a joint group between CEN and CENELEC, a focus group looking at AI for Europe and developing an AI standardization roadmap for Europe. Um, and you have Etsy, where also in several part, uh, in several groups, AI is already uh, considered. And you have the national level, of course, in Germany, Dean. I just listed some here. There are many others, of course. And I just listed Dean Afnor, BSI, Unin for Italy, NEN for the Netherlands, or at least for the, for the US. And now, coming towards the, the end of my overview, there are already a number of standards under development that are of high relevance to ethics in the broadest sense. Um, and you can see here, I mentioned already a lot, JTC1, SC42, and I just list some of the standards. It's an extract, it's not, not complete, but some where I believe they have high relevance for, for our discussion today and for the discussion also about European values and uh, responsible AI. So you have, a just starting project with a management system standards on AI. This is a standard to define processes. How should the processes in your company be? It may go a bit along what I explained before, have an AI uh, official in place, etc. cetera. Um, it's just starting this project, so it's, it's nothing defined yet, but it addresses these topics. You have an overview of ethical and societal concerns um, as a technical report, TR, um, which also starts to, to sum up the concerns, sum them up and then follow on work will be to see what standards are needed, how, how can international standards um, address these concerns. You have one about bias in AI systems and AI aided decision making, very important. Another one on trustworthiness and AI and one on governance implications of the use of AI by organizations. This goes probably together with the upcoming management system standard, which will build also in parts on this governance standard. In IEC, in the International Electrotechnical Committee, um, mainly responsible for standardization in the area of electrotechnology, manufacturing, automation, you have the Systems Evaluation Group 10, which looks at ethics in autonomous and artificial intelligence applications. So very important also from the implementation side, the application side already addressed at an international level. I already mentioned IEEE with their very broad initiative, the global initiative on ethics of autonomous and intelligent systems, the P7000 series in IEEE and in some parts really pioneering work about how, about how standardization, technical standardization can address the topic of AI and ethics. Um, they also start currently work on governance of AI systems. And there are several specific activities, for instance, about machine learning, but also about autonomous contracting, these kind of things. And since Seneleg, I already mentioned the roadmap on European AI standardization. And now following this roadmap focus group activity under preparation is the setting up of a technical committee, a joint technical committee between SEN and Senelec, the two of the three European standardization organizations recognized under law in Europe. Um, and um, yeah, this is on its way. So just to put it in a nutshell, AI is a broad field and differentiation of the exact technology and its use is important. Imperatives, guidelines are available regarding a transparent and responsible use of AI. Open technologies, open standards, open source play a major role in addressing societal values and ethical topics around AI. And very concrete and relevant standards are already underway and they do consider European requirements, for instance, those coming from the high level expert group. 
and already to give a flavor here, happy to receive questions later on when we have a session and to go into the discussion. This concludes my intro words. Thank you very much so far. Thank you, Joachim, for that. That was a comprehensive rundown of what we're going to be talking about. So now we'll quickly uh, move on uh, to just introduce our other panelists before we start the uh, the panel debate. Uh, so if uh, Deborah DiGiacomo, who's a senior manager at Wavestone, if you can give yourself a little introduction. We can't hear you. Well, I can't hear you. Okay, uh, just uh, have a little play around, Deborah, uh, and we'll move around. We'll move on to perhaps Ibrahim Haddad, who can give a sh short introduction of yourself while, while Deborah's seeing if she can fix him up. Is this me? Am I unable to hear anyone? Well, at least I can hear you, Jack. And it you can hear me. Okay, yeah. so everyone can hear me. Ibrahim, we can hear you. Let's try Romeo Kainza from <laughs> IBM. Let's give you a go, see if you can, we can get your audio going. Okay. okay. Thanks a lot. So uh, for Deborah, I have a tip. Just reload your page no. and give access, uh, give access to your microphone. And Ibrahim, maybe you have put your uh, voice recorder. Just make sure you plug to the correct uh, output. Maybe your output is... Um, not from the laptop, from the voice recorder. So anyway, so I'm Romeo. I, I work for IBM for a special department. It's called the uh, Center for Open Source Data and AI Technologies. And I'm the focal point for trusted AI technology there. So I'm responsible for all the open source package we have donated to the Linux Foundation, which Ibrahim maybe will uh, come to later. Thanks. Thank you so much, Romeo. So, Ibrahim, perhaps you can introduce yourself. We, we've got your microphone now. Awesome. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Haddad. I am the executive director of Aleph AI and Data Foundation. We are a not-for-profit organization based in the U.S. Uh, under the Linux Foundation. And our mission is to support and enable open source development and innovation in the domain of AI, analytics, and data. Thank you for having me on this webinar. Thank you very much indeed. So um, perhaps we can wait a moment to see if Seth Deborah gets on, but if not, we will we will press ahead and and start our discussions. I think. Um, I, don't know. Uh, I can't see her. When she comes back, we will we will continue. Our, we'll allow her a moment. Just join to, uh, us. She did. She has to. Uh, if I, yeah, she has to give access to the microphone now. She joined as a participant. Oh, and so to the video, see. yes. Yeah. So there's at the top right of the screen. There's a button, Deborah. You have to click on that to give access to your microphone and share your screen. Uh, yeah. Oh, now I've lost audio entirely. Ah, ah, Deborah. Hope it's working now. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, so Excellent. give yourself a short introduction. Apologies. Okay, everybody. you were waiting for me then. Excellent. We were no waiting problem. for you. We had a couple Thank of minutes. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. So thank you everyone again. Uh, very glad to be participating in this uh, talk. Uh, a little bit about me. Uh, I am for a bit more than 10, uh, more than 10 years, I've been working in advisory services to the European institutions, mostly on digital policies and assessing and advising on impacts of technologies on EU legislative initiatives. Uh, I'm currently uh, leading a team running the Commission Open Source Observatory, OZOR. Uh, if you have heard about it. Uh, and I have also been part of the 
Task Force on AI and Cybersecurity, organized by the Center for European and Policy Studies, CEPS, also a think tank in Brussels. And um, uh, regarding research, I have uh, recently been involved in the research on the importance of transparency and AI and how uh, the AI ecosystem can evolve towards an ethical uh, AI by design. So this is my, my background. I try to be very quick so that we can uh, go for the, the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Deborah. I really appreciate it. So, so let's start. This, I mean, the point of this uh, discussion that we want to have is is how can uh, open source and standardization work in building a, an ethical AI that is used by users? How does this sort of enter the real world? And I think that question, how does that happen, probably starts perhaps first with you, Ibrahim. Perhaps you can launch into this. How you feel that. Um, companies, organizations like your own uh, can implement an ethical, technical reality? Yes, uh, thank you, Jack, for the question. Um, so I think my basic hypothesis is that open source offers the really major benefits that are very unique to AI. We understand and we all know the benefits of open source in general, you know, the peer review, fast development cycle, uh, the networking effect of uh, having a lot of people and organization collaborating. However, what's really unique in the uh, open source that applies to AI are five different areas. The first one is fairness. Uh, second one is robustness. Uh, third one is explainability. Fourth one is lineage. And fifth one is open data. And I will briefly explain each one very, very briefly. Uh, so all the work in open source is done in the open. Uh, you can see what I'm working on. I can see what you are working on. I can provide feedback on your work. You can provide feedback on mine, incorporate uh, uh, work coming from different people and different opinions and different backgrounds. And there is 100% uh, transparency in the work. And there is a uh, meritocracy, meaning you know, the people who are really good at doing something, they're actually the one contributing. And when it comes to AI, this kind of transparency and openness are extremely critical in the uh, path to achieve ethical AI, you know, trust, trusted and responsible AI. Uh, from a fairness perspective, we need to be able to have tools, libraries and methods uh, that are open, that are collectively developed to ensure fairness in models. Uh, from a robustness perspective, a very similar uh, approach. We need to have uh, openly developed tools that allows us to verify the robustness that nothing in terms of models or data have been tampered with. Uh, from an explanatory perspective, we need to make sure that uh, neither data uh, or models, uh, or actually both, uh, we have ways to explain, for instance, how the model works. You know, if, if you are a bank and uh, your, your whole system runs on an AI model in terms of giving loans, you need to be able to have consistent results and have to, the ability to explain how the system works. And uh, lineage, we need methods that are developed collectively in the open uh, to track the origin and how things are changing over time, whether it's data and models. And at the bottom of these four different layers, we need open data. We need methods that will allow us to sort, tag, identify, and track the governance uh, of all these data sets and ensure privacy and security as uh, Johan explained earlier. So from an open source perspective, there's a huge benefits uh, to the society in general for using the open source methodology in getting to it towards the world where we have ethical uh, use of AI, where we have trusted and responsible AI. And um, one last word on uh, tying this to standardization. So at the Linux Foundation, uh, we have uh, not long ago, actually in uh, early this year, in May of 2020, announced that the JDF, Joint Development Foundation, which is an umbrella foundation under the Linux Foundation, has been formally approved as an ISO IEC JTC1. Uh, and uh, Johan actually touched a little bit uh, on these. Uh, so now we have the ability uh, to host projects as part of JDF, Joint Development Foundation, and drive them towards uh, standardization uh, with uh, a lot of ease. Uh, so now we have that hook between open source and standardization. Uh, and really massive benefits uh, for going that way or when it comes to ensuring ethical AI. 
Thank you, Ibru. So, so from that, though, when you're talking about all of that happening between organisations and businesses, perhaps, Romeo, uh, we can ask you about how that then is implemented for users, how this then becomes a reality for people as you, perhaps the person taking the bank loan or the person who is, uh, you know, coming into, ca into contact with AI on the internet, on the social media platform, Romeo. Yeah, so see, using these libraries, it's now possible to give you an explanation of why the AI algorithm came up with a certain decision. So if you are rejected for the bank loan, you, for example, can inquire the algorithm, what are the reasons or the key features of my profile which led to this? And the other thing is what I'm really hoping to see soon is for all the recommendation engines, so the targeted advertisements and uh, playlists on YouTube and Facebook feeds, that we actually get a button or something which allows us to see what part of our personality profile let this ad to be shown to us. And uh, all those tools are now under open governance under the Linux Foundation and are openly available. So that's a huge breakthrough, in my opinion. Perhaps then moving on to Deborah. What, I mean, it is it is a big breakthrough to have that connection. Well, how do you see it when it comes to sort of expanding those ideas from 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 that position? So I think um, uh, what what we have seen and completing uh, building on what uh, my colleagues have been talking, there is uh, several ethical dilemmas dilemmas that we need to 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 tackle, and that we are we are trying to work from both sides, technical and uh, policy. And uh, at certain point, they need to converge. So it's like on fairness, on transparency, on collaboration, on trust, accountability, and morality. So certain points there can be really tackled with um, uh, what I would say the uh, almost business as usual of uh, uh, open practices or uh, the way of open developments. And um, what I think is that um, open source have uh, like while the fairness part can be a bit more complex to tackle because we have uh, bias involved on the development and uh, involved also on the, um, on the design of algorithms. On the other, if you see from another perspective, the transparency can really benefit from open uh, practices and uh, the way open source is there for a while already. So I think that is one of the main uh, points of uh, open source practices, not only on the um, on the business as usual, as I would say, but uh, that is like uh, um, on quality, on security, on the um, uh, easing customization, lowering entry costs. But uh, I think specifically to AI, uh, open practices can uh, enable the experimentation. So even in small uh, and medium enterprises now with uh, all these technologies being made uh, open source, they are uh, they have uh, of course fewer barriers uh, like uh, the high licensing fees that could be there. Uh, they also could face the limited uh, talent, and these are two things that uh, the open practices can really uh, enable. That is the access to skills, the community itself, also uh, increase the freedom to innovate, le leverage the, by leverage ideas of the community, not only in a closed pool of resources, and of course the. Um, uh, all of this could uh, really build on a greater trust in the technology that is uh, fundamentally what open source de development values. So the practice on, uh, would tackle several issues hindering or raising concerns on the ethical AI uh, designing approach. So uh, leading on from that, I think probably it's, it's, I'll come to you, Timo, in a second, but maybe Jochen, you can put, put on this because this is the reality of using open source for sort of small, uh, you know, even individuals that are using uh, these sort of systems and software for themselves to be able to build and change and adapt uh, AI in in the way that they want it to, they want to, or perhaps in in a new way that we we don't know about yet. But obviously, in this moment with the sort of expansion uh, of the technical implementation, it is the bigger players uh, like yourself that are that are sort of leading the way probably i wonder if you can talk to that how can we make sure that that sort of idea of the opportunity of uh, of open source uh, can can still be broad well first of all i would say I mean, it's a very good question but by by going into an, an open organization like the linux foundation ai building a community where not just the technology providers 
they may be leading, okay, because they are the ones who have the expertise, the deep level knowledge about AI, but by making the code open, by building a community around it and allowing, whether it is your clients, your customers or public sector uh, contributions from administrations, whoever to work closely on the further development of the technology of the open source of the source code is already something that uh, that has the huge potential uh, it already does contribute to trust and, 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 and transparency and has the huge potential to collaboratively bring um, the some some key technologies forward to to have this uh, mutual collaboration across organizational boundaries right also then you mentioned everybody can take it can play with it can see what it is can look into it um i mean i was i was i thought it was a very positive statement from the european commission the other day to say how open source is a key element for achieving um, digital sovereignty because it prevents that you work with closed black boxes whatever closed boxes it allows you to look at the code to look at what's going on and and also this is is important and um it is um, yeah you probably you need some technology drivers if you want high high class state of the art technology they need to be ready to contribute it but by contributing it by opening up to a group by saying let's let further develop this in open innovation uh, processes um uh, you you create a completely new ecosystem on on driving the technology its implementation and the trust and, and confidence Mm. Thank you, uh, Jochen. So, Timo, perhaps to, to, to move it on to you, if we can, um, as a suggestion, a suggestion as a question, where are the ethical uh, sort of difficulties? Where is uh, where are we most likely to find ethical concerns and troubles in the implementation of AI into into our societies? And what do we actually need to do when we're implementing? technical uh in in a technical fashion to to prevent those those sort of hurdles or or trouble moments that might come up yeah thank you very much um i think i can directly continue uh, on what omi already said so it's uh, accountability it's traceability of decisions which are um, very important for individuals, but very hard to understand and to trace. And uh, you may know from my report on the DSA that I'm uh, convinced that personalized advertisements are harmful and shouldn't be a business model. And uh, I really like the idea to at least have some transparency and accountability. So. Uh, based on which information is the decision based. So, and I think if we uh, have the possibility to trace the decisions, uh, we have clarity and um, we have, um, we can create some kind of liability. And this is important for end users, for consumers. And so this is, I think, what needs to be um, what needs to be really clear. Yeah, I think this is I think this is it. And one of the things perhaps we should move on to slightly is talking about perhaps more about the end users, the people that are actually, uh, um, you know, affected by this. So, Deborah, I know that this is something that you've uh, spoken about, uh, about the, these black box tests and how you're you're perhaps concerned about the sort of doing the tests on ai where we don't really understand what the the, the what's inside the what we're testing i wonder if you can talk to that a little bit yes uh, so i think we are in a point that um generally people were recognized that black box AI approaches are unacceptable. I think this is recognized in policy, this is recognized in any piece of work uh, we see published lately. And uh, this is, a, uh, uh, as I think uh, um, we have heard today already, like uh, the data belong to the users and they need to uh, be informed. Um, so the transparency is, is generally about this, is that they are informed on how they are impacted by the algorithm. And this, um, 
brings us to a bit what um, uh, is called the um, the, uh, the 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 trade-off between transparency and uh, the the barriers on on openness as well. So uh, what we call transparency paradox. So generating more information about AI may create real benefits and this no one uh, disagrees but it also can create risks and it's these risks that uh, i believe we need to manage more and more that we make the users and the people who are being impacted by this algorithm so someone because i think also the policy puts a bit of um, difference on the level of impact of course um, uh, house loan uh, decision is much more impactful on, than uh, shopping or a consumption uh, ad that you are that you are dis that are, is displayed in your screen. But uh, in any way, uh, data is used to train these algorithms, and decisions are being taken. So this is the uh, by decisions are being taken by an algorithm that is uh, using some rules, and uh, it's very important that uh, this transparency. And uh, these rules are in certain way um, transparent to who is uh, being impacted by the by the decision in the end. Uh, I think one of the papers of uh, Professor Andrea Arenda shows that it's not only about uh, uh, giving gen generic explanations, but also uh, explaining uh, in detail why what are the reasons and the uh, and uh, that this decision is taken. I don't know if it's clear what yeah, I want no, to go. I, but... I, I think I think you're totally right because I mean I, I think one of the interesting things we're in a moment where people are quite aware that AI is affecting their lives that we are being targeted with certain things but people aren't necessarily aware about how to access the information about themselves at the moment or or what right they have and perhaps this is something we can I can ask you about Ibrahim about how how end users should be informed about the processes while making it clear how I mean because these are these are complicated complex algorithms difficult data sets that are used in really specific ways so how can we make sure that users are informed while understanding and making the information we give them actually useful yes uh, thank you Jack for the question I mean I think when it comes to how we can do this we can look to how we're doing things that are very similar uh, to informing people about AI, for instance. Uh, so one of the similar cases that comes to my mind are uh, open source licenses. So when companies integrate open source components in their products and services, they need to acknowledge and inform the end user that the phone, the tablet, uh, the TV, the fridge, whatever appliances or devices or a software you are acquiring actually includes open source code licensed under the following licenses and here are your rights and uh, where you can download the code and so on. So now taking that idea as a parallel to the question you just asked me, uh, I think we can go down the route of, you know, if there is an AI system running and providing a certain product and a service, we should ideally provide to the end user, uh, similarly to what we do with compliance, kind of an explanation of you know, this is based on the following algorithm, and here's how this algorithm works, which brings us directly to the explainability function of a given model. We need to be able to explain how a model works. It's really not acceptable to say, oh, this is really complex, you're not going to get it. No, you know, we need to be able to inform people that this model is based on these parameters, and here's how each of these parameters is used as a way, and here's how it functions. Uh, and it might be as easy as providing disclaimers on the various technologies used and where the data is coming from and under which licenses it's coming from, uh, the, how the data is being governed, what the company providing the service or product is using uh, with respect to the security of this information and uh, to the privacy uh, concerns in relation to that, uh, and also how this system uh, is able to ensure uh, there is no bias and that it offers fair service to everybody. And I think once we reach a point where we kind of take all this information and formalize it in a way where we're able to provide a standardized way to present this information and we kind of connect to the standard now, then we're able to communicate uh, as companies, right, to the end users of our products in a standardized way, you know, how our system works based on what technologies and how we're protecting your um, data, 
privacy and, and, and offering security and how do we explain uh, the different models we use. And I think it has to be driven by uh, a kind of a, an acknowledgement, you know, a disclaimer. You know, if you want to use this product or this service, we incorporate specific AI technologies in it. Here's how it works. By accepting this information, you're able to continue and use the product. Something, you know, that sort. Yeah, I think I think this is it. But you mentioned that this is this sort of uh, uh, some sort of standardization of a disclaimer. Yeah. Romeo, perhaps bringing you in, you could can you talk about where we are with that? Where where the standardization of informing users is right now, from your perspective? It's right at the beginning, so we just announced a system which is called Fact Sheets, which gives you insights uh, on how the AI model is performing. I'm getting some background noise. Maybe Irene, can you go on mute, mute please? Um, so yeah. someone is not on mute. Still. Okay, thank you. Um, because so, there's the sign that there's sound. Okay, now it's better. Thanks. So um, that that's one thing, and uh, so this this stuff about explainability and bias detection and adversarial robustness. This is something the research community is actively researching on. So every week we see a new paper, new algorithm, and we just re-implement those algorithms in our toolkits. Um, for getting into a standardization, I think we need a officially recognized standardization body, which takes the most relevant state-of-the-art measures for those four categories and defines, okay, if this algorithm is doing such an important decision, it has to comply with this and this and this standards, and those are the measures, and the implementation is this and that, and the implementation is open source, so everybody can check on the implementation. And I think that's something we can emerge on, and I think that's the legislative who can actually uh, push this forward to, to tell standard bodies to actually come up with a standard for, for those measures. Do you know what, Romeo, you set us up perfectly to move at the at the right time that we have time scheduled to move our discussion perhaps more directly towards the policy angle. Now, I just want to remind everybody that is uh, that is participating and watching this event that you are able to start, uh, keep your questions coming in, keep sending them in, in the chat box. At the end of the event, we will, we will focus on the Q&A and continue uh, continue the discussion with our panelists there. But let's move on now to a more policy-based uh, policy discussion. And, and for that, I think Timo probably will start with you. Um, let's, let's start where, Romeo, where, where Ro Romeo left off there. The idea of some sort of body, some sort of oversight body, um, is that possible at the moment? Would that need to be European? How would that work? How, how do you see that, that sort of shaking down? Thank you very much. First of all, sorry, Deborah, accusing you for the background noise, but Hopin insists that there's sound from your part, so I maybe it's confused. So sorry for that. <laughs> I, I see there's no noise from you, so, so sorry for that. And uh, now back to your question, Jack. Um, well, I think it's necessary to have uh, oversight, and I would like to see a European entity, a European body, um to do that um i would like to see even an, an agency equipped with the possibilities to do that to check the um compliance with ethical requirements um unfortunately in the ai reports which i already mentioned um there was no majority to establish a european agency so the closest to European entity um, the, we are is my report on the Digital Services Act, where I mention an European entity which could be either a network of national authorities or a European agency. Um, with the lessons learned from the implementation of the GDPR, uh, I wouldn't be happy to see many different national responsible bodies because they are interpreting rules differently and uh, maybe and sometimes i think they are understanding their role differently so i think there's a reason why many uh platforms 
choose Ireland as their uh, responsible uh, authority. So because you could argue that their main aim isn't to protect uh, data of consumers. So, but um, yeah, the, the, and the agency uh, could then communicate with the standardization bodies to make uh, that link without having to go via hard policy. So that's why I think this could be um, a good solution. But again, um, the majority of the colleagues wasn't convinced on that. But I think this will develop once we have a, um, an approach by the European Commission. So a legislative, legislative proposal. But now we are, of course, in, in the stage where we are gathering ideas and drafting our initiative reports. This is it. I mean, I was looking through uh, a list of all of the EU's agencies thinking about this, about where where it could attach if they didn't create their own agency. And I think the one I, I thought was most relative was perhaps the, the fundamental rights agency, but it still doesn't, I don't know, I don't know. It doesn't... It's not an, the fundamental rights agency is heavily understaffed. And what yeah, they are exactly. doing is to write comparisons and uh, reports on the state of play so unfortunately exactly. their scope is very limited it's deliberately but they wouldn't be in a situation at the moment to do that one could exactly. think maybe they... about the ombudsperson but this is yeah it's not yeah, this doesn't it's feel like anywhere where uh, structure yeah, it just doesn't feel like anywhere that, that it can fit right now. Exactly. Um, so, so let's to, to you, Jochen. Perhaps you can speak to this as a as a company who uh, understands this sort of policy network and the idea of where whether national or EU bodies would fit. I wonder whether you can explain how you see it. Perhaps talking from the perspective of the uh, the white paper on AI that, AI that the that the Commission put out. What would make it easiest? for you, mm -hmm. policy-wise? Yeah, sure. Um, let me maybe start as a company. We have a lot of experience in complying with EU technical regulation in many areas, like electromagnetic compatibility, low voltage, um, the, the machinery directive a little bit, the radio equipment directive, all, all of these, OK? And um, the, the system. The, the framework, the legal framework applied there is the so-called new legislative framework, which is based on the now not so new anymore, but still called new approach, uh, 30 years old, but still still very powerful for, for Europe. And the system is very simple. I try to make it in simple words. Government makes regulation with essential requirements, including a, a, a risk mechanism with different modules, so high risk and low risk, etc. Then industry can develop standards to meet these essential requirements and based on self-assessment for low risk or not the highest risk areas, uh, make a statement of conformity. And under this statement, industry is allowed to work, uh, to put their products onto the market under the presumption of conformity in Europe. And you have market surveillance um, from the public sector to make sure that there are no issues, there are no no uh, problems there, nobody tricks, okay? I would see that for certain areas, I mean, we, we first need a discussion on AI, do we need to have broad regulation or high risk areas? I can imagine for high risk areas, regulation makes sense. On the broad scale, I'm not sure, okay? We need to have this discussion. But I could imagine that the same system would work for AI as well, to have essential requirements laid down by the legislator and have standards with which you can meet them, self-assessment or for high risk areas, compulsory third party assessment and market surveillance. And um, I am not so sure whether an agency, we heard agencies may be understaffed, agencies may lack the actual experts to assess, et cetera. Um, and and um, I, I think this system that works well for product safety, for everything, we should try to apply it because it also allows for innovation, for a lot of innovative potential. The standards always try to have the state of the art included. Everybody can participate. You have academia, you have industry with their experts, you have consumers, users, 
uh, SMEs who participate. Um, and if I, if I may give one example where this worked extremely well um, was uh, at the beginning of the COVID-19 situation, where a uh, completely different area, but we needed to have in Europe where there was a shortage of face masks of personal protective equipment and with the standards being available um, and uh, the clear rules, uh, this equipment could also be brought into the market very fast. Industry knew what to look at knew how to follow the standards and they could be developed and this is a basic basic um the, the basic power of this new legislative framework and i would i would see that we should before we discuss anything else we should see in how far new technologies like ai may fit into this define what needs to be regulated and then see can this fit under this new legislative framework which has been so instrumental for the common market Thank you, Jochen. So let's let's move on, perhaps to to some of the more sort of solid policy that we have. So we have the open source software strategy, twenty 2020 twenty to twenty twenty three, and I wonder, Ibrahim, if I can ask you what how you see this uh, changing or or adapting in the current sort of technological landscape. Yes, thank you. Um, so when it comes to open source um, and AI, and you know specifically your question. Uh, we've seen this happen with many other uh, te technological areas. So if you look at clouds, uh, you know, before AI and even uh, financial tech sector, and before that, the networking sector, and before that, the telecom sector, and so on. So these technological things come in waves, and now we're riding the AI wave. And what's really interesting is when we look at the landscape uh, and we see what is really happening in terms of AI, uh, in general, we realize that most of the efforts uh, when it comes to frameworks, libraries, and enabling technologies really in relation to AI, machine learning, uh, deep learning, uh, uh, NLPs, uh, data models, you know, all of these technologies under AI or different categories are actually happening in open source because companies realize that the actual value is not the platform or the library that you create. It's uh, the real value is sitting in the applications you develop, the real value and the models. So companies are coming together and collaborating together on creating these different uh, building blocks. You know, you can think of them as different Lego pieces. Uh, and these different building blocks, we capture them in our uh, open source AI landscape. So it is uh, available via the web. The address is L as in landscape dot lfai dot foundation and we capture there about 300 key projects that are open source coming from over 220 different companies uh, so what i see going forward is uh, additional increase in collaboration and more and more companies are joining this trend in open sourcing their ai and machine learning data mobile technologies and collaborating with other companies on these different building pieces. And then once these building pieces reach what I consider kind of the value line, anything above that value line will become proprietary. So this is where collaboration stops and then companies start investing in, in parallel on their internal R&D to build that differentiation, their applications, and figure out ways to monetize the data and the models that they have come. So definitely, the future is very positive in terms of collaboration in the space of AI, but there are definitely a lot of uh, concerns in relation to uh, privacy, uh, in relation to security, and in relation to fairness and bias. I mean, all of those issues are things that the European Commission is trying to look into through through the white paper, through the digital strategy, the Digital Services Act. Deborah, you you work with them, you advise and consult on these issues. Where do you, do you think the European Commission is is uh, um, focused in the right areas? Do you think that open source is is a priority for them? Do you think they understand it properly? Do you think the the the, the EU is is prepared and ready for what needs to happen? 
that's a trick question. But uh, I think, well, in the several years I've been working with the Commission on Digital Policies, I think um, uh, open sourcing definitely has gaining a lot of uh, traction in the last years, the last few years. Like, uh, and this is uh, very clear with the release of the of the strategy uh, last month, and the strategy make. Uh, clear references to the leading model of open source, uh, how this uh, is uh, necessary for uh, platforms or software development, also make uh, um, clear links to artificial intelligence. Uh, what I see that is uh, missing, and I, I maybe my colleagues can, can confirm in the audience, is uh, the spell out of openness and open software in the artificial intelligence publications. It's very difficult to find um, uh, really like a clear mention uh, to open source or to um, like really spell it out. And I think this is where uh, the commission can act, uh, especially now with this, uh, uh, with the paper of the strategy and with the what what is preached as a leading by example is to bring more visibility for of the advantages of open software for artificial intelligence. If you see even in the white paper, we don't have a reference. We have no reference to uh, or push towards the the open uh, technology. I like the term used by Johan Do open technologies because it's open source uh, software. We also have work on the on DigiConnect on open hardware and it's, uh, open standards. That this is a point that uh, we are not there yet, but there is definitely a good momentum on the push of open software, uh, and I think that is a lot of work on the whole ecosystem to bring these two together. Yeah. So, so Timo, perhaps bringing you in, what are you uh, pressing on? What are your when you're looking at these these different um, the strategy and the and the white paper, etc. What are your key concerns? What do you want changed? What are your priorities to make sure that things are ethical, remain open, remain accessible? Thank you very much. Uh, there was uh, a comment in the chat, which I think is very interesting. Of course, we are turning to that in, by, during the Q&A session, but uh, I think it's uh, it's perfect to highlight how complicated the situation is. So. Uh, the user Ben, it, it's Ben, he, he says that uh, free trade agreements are also a, a growing problem. And this really uh, illustrates how uh, difficult it is because there are so many areas which could have a positive or negative uh, influence on the development of, of open source and trustworthy open source. Um, I think if I have to bring in one problem, then it's that the strategies at the European level to promote the use of open source software are very weak and not ambitious enough. And uh, in addition, uh, we see that we do not um, invest enough money in the development of open source in uh, Europe. And I think uh, the uh, this could be uh, a unique opportunity for Europe to um, fund something like the Open Technology Fund uh, much more in, intensively. Um, so I think we, we should reconsider uh, open source as a very important uh, aspect for our digital sovereignty, which is often quoted, but no one really explains what it is. And I think open source would really fit into this concept because it would make Europe independent from the development of software from other parts in the world. Yeah, I mean, and this is something that is, there's an acute awareness, I think, around Europe that in certain, especially in a lot of sort of technological jumps, we've been half a step behind perhaps on the international scene R R Romeo to bring you in on that I mean from a more practical implementation how do you see it does there need to be I mean can Europe lead are we too late perhaps are other people streaking ahead of ahead of us on open source te technologies I wonder just what your assessment is when you're when you're working with your with people you yeah, so it's never too late. So, uh, of course, the Silicon Valley culture is, is 
somehow different, but we see these hotspots now emerging. And I think Berlin is some sort of getting the new Silicon Valley in Germany. And there is, I've uh, spoken to many startup uh, founders and they told me that there is more than enough money for them. If they have a great idea, there are enough EU uh, money pots they can actually get access to. So that's not a problem. I think what we missed a bit is the coolness factor. So everybody wants to go to Silicon Valley. But I think uh, the new shift towards working at home and working distributed globally will help us to just stay where we are. And uh, one concern I have is that most of the open source foundations are actually from U.S. And uh, in theory, I've read that somewhere um, the U.S. government could basically say, okay, we just regulate this. This is now a property of uh, United States and it falls under the export regulations. And then we have to start from scratch. So we should actively find a central uh, foundation in Europe, which can also act something like the Apache Software Foundation. And what I'm also missing a bit is um, the academic contributions to open source. They just uh, go up to their paper publications, but it doesn't come to a majority. And uh, on the other hand, industry, they are using open source as some sort of warfare. Now it's same with closed source products. Now it's open source warfare. It's one open source product against the other. And I think Jochen wants to speak, so I give uh, Jochen the word, of course. I don't want to interrupt you. I just want to no say problem. I very much agree. Um, and I know from discussions, we have had discussions in the context of Industry 4.0 in Germany, for instance, that there is still a bit of uncertainty amongst, for instance, universities, what it means if, if their professors, if their staff contribute to open source. Um, how do they check? I mean, contributing to open source is, on the one hand, very easy. On the other hand, of course, if you have IP in the background, intellectual property, etc., you want to check a bit. You want not to give things away that you don't want to give away, etc. Et so organizations need to build some capacity around this. And, and there is still um, some uncertainty yeah, amongst some uh, organizations in the academic world, but also amongst new players or, or more traditional industry players who would like to contribute but who are not sure what happens if if my person contributes code and the code is faulty but it gets in am i then liable these are questions that people ask for contributing to open source in general yeah? not not about ai but in general and there seems to be um, the culture is evolving and it may also be a generation gap a bit. Yeah, younger people are more ready. They want to contribute and then they, they face the gray haired lawyers in their organization saying, oh, stop, please. Careful, careful. This is something where we might see to help. It may also be something for the legislators, for Timo to take with him to see, is there something where the legislator needs to produce clarity on liability questions that are up? Uh, are they valid? Are they not valid? Uh, these kind of things. So, Romeo, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt you. <laughs> Only one thing to, to say, um, as an example, there the most two mostly used deep learning frameworks are TensorFlow and PyTorch. So TensorFlow is led by Google, PyTorch is led by Facebook. And uh, previously there was another, which was called Theano, that was led by a US university. And as I, I said, uh, the, the open source warfare is currently uh, at the highest and we just need to be aware that all the major companies have a high uh, political interest in, in shaping this open source world. Thank, thank you, Robert. Let's go to you, Ibrahim, quickly, and then we're going to move on to the questions. We've got, we've got quite a few interesting questions coming. So, Ibrahim, if you, if you want to just... Uh... Yes, thank you, Jack. Just so, minutes. just 30, minutes, uh, 30 seconds uh, interjection. So, I, I actually work with a lot of uh, startup uh, companies in Berlin. I mean, just to the point of Romeo, it's an extremely hotbed of uh, AI technologies. A lot of them are focusing on open source. Uh, but the reason I wanted to, to interject for just 10 seconds here is uh, to mention that we are actually opening a formal office entity uh, in Brussels. Uh, so you will, you will have a Linux Foundation presence, uh, a formal entity in the EU coming very, very soon. So that, 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 that might alleviate some of the concerns that uh, you may have on this front. 
thank thank you for your, thank you interesting that you're coming there we go i didn't know that um so let's uh let's uh, start with some of the questions that we've that we've had come in, uh, and perhaps perhaps a nice way of doing this is if you if you have something a, a response you want to say, raise your hand and I'll, I'll give the floor to you. So, Marco Batani Auckland has said, "What does the panel have to say about explanations presented to the users? Say, model version one explains the user what he or she needs to do to get a loan. User complies, comes back three nights later to ask for a loan." again and then they get a new rejection from a different model giving a new explanation um, about why they haven't got that loan i think well i hope i've read that in a, in a clear way um, how do we fix this how do we make sure that there's continuity um, through through the implementation anyone want to jump in romeo maybe i don't know yeah so um <laughs> I think it's more uh, a question from the legislative perspective, but uh, it boils down to the standardization. Um, so if you have a model and it complies with a certain standard, then of course rules change. And if the bank changes their rules, uh, it's the same problem. No, It's just the frequency where rules are changing um, is, is basically causing the problem. So, so this is something which can be regulated. Know that, for example, if you didn't comply with version 1.0 formally and you are now complying with version 1.0 within the next X month, then you still have to be assessed against model version 1.0 instead of 1.1. Yeah. So I actually I actually had something I wanted to to speak to you, Timo, which we were talking about, which we were talking about just 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 there um, before from the legislative proposal, where we were talking about how professors and stuff might not be able to um, quite clearly understand whether what they're doing is legal or not, and there's this sort of grey area. How quickly can the EU act on this? How quickly can legislation and rules come in fr from your point of view? You know, you're, you're legislating on these issues. Uh, you know, it needs to be done quickly, right? Yes, <laughs> um, but uh, I, I wouldn't expect miracles here or so wonders to happen. Um, so, this will definitely take some time. So EU legislation can be quick. So at the end of the last mandate, we were uh, able to uh, negotiate uh, a new law on single-use plastics within, I think, roughly nine months. But uh, if you take a look at the e-privacy regulation, which isn't still finished, uh, which still isn't uh, finished, and this goes on for years now, it can uh, take very long so um i i think that the general the general law uh, will be uh, can be in place within i don't know maybe two years but uh it's not done uh, then because then the problem starts because you have to adapt the framework to developments uh, technical developments technical progress which happens so um and these needs to be done by implementing acts and these can be adopted quite uh, quicker or speedier than the framework re regulation so um yeah i think uh, two years is uh, is a good guess um once the commission starts with the draft. Yeah, and also two years sounds like like quite a long time, but actually it's not a long time because if, if the fights go for many, for four years, then you even start to enter a new legislative term. I know that's, so this is the thing with these issues, right? Is they need to, they need to get done. Um, okay, so we'll, we'll go back to the questions. Um, there was actually a question directly for you, Jochen, and I know you have kind of answered a bit in the chat, but we'll, we'll, we'll put it to you here. How do you envision market surveillance on the AI system market? I wonder if you can perhaps vocalize some of the answer that you put in the chat box there. Yeah, what I, what I responded is, sure, it's, a, it's an important question. Yeah. And of course, it means skill building on the side of the market surveillance authorities. So if you, but it should be possible. Right. It's a it's a new technology. You need new skilled people. Um, you need to train them. 
um, but it, it, it works in areas where complex hardware is being assessed against regulatory requirements. Um, I mentioned electromagnetic compatibility, uh, I, I think, and I mentioned something else, but I would have to scroll now and look for it. Um, uh, oh, the medical device regulation, also medical equipment is being checked. Um, um, I mean, the way this works is you have a standard, you implement the standards, you operate on the presumption of conformity, and then there are these checks being done by market authority surveillance. They pick you out of a random list, or maybe they, they have you as a suspect, I don't know. Then they ask you to work with them to assess whether you are really compliant. Um, and these are the, the checks. And for this, you need to build the skills if you talk about AI. Um, sometimes the question is being brought up whether AI, as it is sort of, you need to consider the life cycle of a product as well, or of a service, a technology. Um, and, but here again, we have examples under the NLF with a medical device regulation, which also looks at the life cycle. Um, so, so this is something to learn from. Um, we are starting to discuss this. I believe policymakers are starting to discuss, is this feasible? It's a discussion to have. How is this feasible? What skills do you need? How do you build it up? But um, personally, I would believe it's uh, it's a good system we have in Europe and, and we should try to, to use it as first priority for those areas where we all agree that uh, some sort of regulation and compliance needs to be done. Thank you very much. That was just to say that question was from Xavier Lav Lario. Lario. Um, yeah. So Deborah, I, I've seen that you have a comment you want to make on this, please. Yeah. I, no, I just want to to make a comment. I think the system is slow, but for a good reason. Like uh, that, we need to have a, a good political system in place, and uh, of course, regulation evolves much slower than um, than uh, than technology. But I think uh, in other in some industries, like in the financial services, they use implementing acts as a tool to. Um, to partner with standardization organizations and industry to define standards. So I am um, sometimes a bit concerned only if they stand to the to the to the market, like Johan say, said. I think sometimes it works, but sometimes we can end up in uh, several uh, uh, not de facto standards or some uh, um, closed standards. I think that uh, um, independent independently whether we go for um, agency or not uh, the use of implementing acts can be very useful in this uh, in these cases so that uh, uh, in, uh, that can be can evolve without going through the whole uh, review of uh, regulations of legislative proposals in general but then, yes just i want to add this but then there's then there's sort of they can be challenged much more quickly though no that that doesn't necessarily sort of secure the ecosystem long term right i think and uh, johan or uh, tim you can you can intervene but uh, um it can be challenged but it can also evolve is a trade off if you hard code it on the main text and this is uh, really known especially i i have the pleasure to work on a, on a bill on um on dg home if you hard code how your system should work in a legislation, and it took nine years to the systems to be implemented, you can imagine that the technology evolved after nine years. And then you have this hard code in the legislation, you need two more years to go to the entire policy life cycle. So the implementing acts works so that legislation continue to be a very good process and uh, uh, supports our beautiful European system, but we can uh, cope with the evolution of uh, of technology I, I i truly believe that this is one one way uh but uh, i mean i think uh, timo uh Johan, you may have uh, some experience on that i couldn't agree more on that so um just an example where i think we we made a mistake is the copyright legislation where we said this law applies to all platforms except and then we had a, a few platforms which were exempted from the scope uh, there was an exemption or there is an exemption in place for github there's one for ebay there's uh, one for dropbox but now what happens if a new service emerge which we don't know yet it would fall under the scope um, so that's why I totally agree uh, with you. And uh, I guess this copyright directive is not going to be reopened within the next 10, 15 years. So this is really a problem. And implementing acts are 
a solution to that as long as uh, the parliament <laughs> is involved. So what's what's I think what's from the democratic point of view shouldn't happen is that only the commission and the member states via the council are uh, entitled to update. So we're just going to take one quick more question before before we sort of wrap up. And this was from John Favreau, who is talking about um, how code, uh, being able to see code is necessary but not sufficient. For instance, in automated driving, code is rarely open source, but the assessor sees it. The key issue is whether the decision process can be explained. And so far, it's too often unclear whether it can meet the safety standard. And I know, Deborah, you, you made a quick uh, comment on that on the transparency paradox as well. Perhaps you can explain what you were what you were talking about in there. Yeah, I didn't really reply to the question. I just uh, said that it's a very good question yeah. because we are really we are also thinking about. Like I think it's a question for most of uh, people involved in the field. I um, uh, I work to Enisa on the on cybersecurity, but. Uh, touch points a bit with this on, the, on automated uh, mobility. And there is a transparency, transpar the paradox is um, we, transparency is positive for sure and is needed. We cannot accept the black box as we discussed here already. But then we have uh, this discussion on what is the right level of transparency, transparency to whom and transparency for which purpose. And then if we can calibrate these three aspects, we probably can uh, have uh, uh, a trade-off between the full transparency, but it's really a challenge. I don't think that is a, a I, I, if someone has the answer to this question, I would be happy to hear. Yeah, that, that's that's the Pandora's box. We can go for another hour and a half on that, I think. Okay, Are we <laughs> exactly. Okay, so I think just to wrap the session, um, if you guys wouldn't mind, I'll just go, go around each of you um, and just um, in sort of 30 seconds, if you can perhaps present your sort of blue sky solution on in the next couple of years, how you can see AI developing in an ethical way. And it, it's just a really sort of succinct statement. And I'll start with you, perhaps, Ibrahim. Hey, Jack. Uh, I was on W. So uh, I think in 30 seconds, uh, I think one of the challenges I see uh, that you know within that time frame is the different legislations coming from different countries, right? So uh, as 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 you know, there are maybe over 40 countries today that have uh, officially uh, different kind of laws in relation to AI. Uh, several countries have appointed ministers of AI or have appointed something of that similar level uh, head of um, ethical AI or uh, or officer of ethics in AI and so on. And I think one of the challenges I see talking to different companies operating in different geographies, uh, EU, Asia, and especially North America, these different major, uh, three major geographies, there's different understanding and different thinking of what constitutes trusted and responsible AI. And I think for the next couple of years and maybe even more, we need to drive towards kind of at least a common base of understanding uh, of what is trusted AI and what needs to be done and what is ethical AI and how can we achieve and gear toward uh, fair and equitable uh, technology from that perspective. Uh, so kind of trying to bring in different legislations to a common base and from there maybe for uh, specifically based on each job. Raj Ibrahim, same, same sort of question to, to you, Romeo. What are the most crucial aspects that need to be resolved in the sort of immediate term uh, regarding making sure the implementation of AI is ethical? Okay, so I think we should move to uh, a security by design system and not uh, security and privacy by trust. So I don't want to trust any EU bodies. I don't want to trust any companies. It should be implemented in the system. I give you one example here. It's a paper which has been leaked. It's from Brussels, 6th of November, 2020. The number is 1243-2-20, Draft Council Resolution for Encryption. And I think uh, I don't want my WhatsApp messages to be decrypted and read by others. Uh, on the other hand, if it can fight child pornography, for example, I might change my mind. But I still don't trust that the EU can implement it in a way that nobody who is not supposed to do can read my messages. So if we can move to systems which are private and secure by design, 
over by trust. That's the future, in my opinion. Very interesting sort of balancing out there, exactly. Deborah, same, same question to you. Where, where's, where's the most crucial aspect of making sure we have an ethical AI system, set of systems? You're muted. You're muted. Sorry. Sure. So, <laughs> plus one of the comments of Remio, I think 100% um, agree, especially on the case that it's very difficult to enforce that um, uh, the system will be used air as they are supposed to do. And this is valid also for uh, border control, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I would like to to say my, if I could make a wish, I think this is the point. If we could make a wish for the next years, I really would like to see that uh, uh, open source and open technologies, open processes are spelled out together with AI, so that uh, they they we we see this that it, we can market better the the importance of openness. Uh, in AI initiatives that we can bring visibility and that we can write open in the in the papers. You can go and you go control find in the papers, we don't find it. So I think uh, this is my wish list to bring really the uh, open source and open initiatives where uh, it should be in the level of importance for, for uh, artificial intelligence. So we, we've got one minute left on the event now. So Jochen, if you can ask you to be extremely brief before we hand over to Timo, what, what your your I'll, I'll, speak, I'll speak double fast. I, 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 I agree with all that has been said before. We are at the beginning of the digital decade. I love to call this the digital 20s. AI will play a key role. Data will be a key role. We need to get it ready to handle. We don't need to be afraid of it. We want to set standards in, in the broader sense of the word standards out of Europe here. We are on a good way and open technologies, open source, open standards will help a lot to increase trust in and uh, facilitate and promote the uptake of the technologies. That's my blue sky. Thank you. Timo, finally. Much. So the short answer would be everything what the, the previous speakers said uh, within a legislative act and a little longer, I think users need to know when AI is used and need to know of the implementation, implementation, implementations, sorry, and they need to see it as an added benefit and not as a threat. So this requires a solid legal framework and honest contributions from the industry. And I think our discussion today was a good starting point for that. I really agree. Uh, I, I, we'll have to wrap it up now. We've, I think we've packed quite a lot actually into quite a short space of time overall. I'd like to thank all of our, all of our five speakers, um, Deborah, Romeo, Ibrahim, Jochen and Timo for uh, speaking so openly and really sort of going in there. And I think we've also managed to sort of speak in quite a, um, an understandable way about what is quite a dense and difficult topic. So thank you so much to the Open Forum Europe for hosting the event. Thank you for everyone for your questions and for watching. And if you want to watch a recording of this, I understand that uh, it will go up on the Open Forum, Forum Europe's YouTube channel by tomorrow. So wishing you all the best. Thanks for, thanks for talking. Thanks for joining and see you soon. Thanks very much. Bye now. Ciao. Bye.